Okay. Then, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to start because it is time. So, welcome everybody, as I said before. Okay, I'm ready. Our first speaker is Daniela Matina from the University of Palermo, a former student of Antonio and Bruno, and an expert in co-dimension growth. So, Daniela. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. It's a very pleasure to be here. Thanks again. Now I'm going to talk about algebras satisfying polynomial identities. And I present some results about the sequence of codimensions. But let me start with the notation and uh, some basic definitions. F is always a field of characteristic zero. A is an associative algebra over F, and F of X is the free associative algebra on a countable set over F. So it's the, just the algebra of all polynomials in the non-commuting variables of X. A polynomial in the free algebra is a polynomial identity for A if it vanishes for all evaluations on the variables on A. And uh, an algebra is called PI if it satisfies a non-zero, so a non-trivial polynomial identity. Okay, let me show some example of uh, PI algebras. Any commutative algebra is PI since it satisfies a uh, Lie commutator of two variables. UT2, the algebra of two by two upper triangular matrices is also PI since it satisfies the product of two commutators of length two. It's obvious since that a commutator of two upper triangular matrices is a strictly upper triangular matrix and the product of two strict upper triangular matrices is zero. And to F, the algebra of two by two matrices over F is also PI. And for instance, it satisfies this identity known as uh, the Wagner all identity. And uh, it is easily seen since a uh, square of a commutator of two matrices is a scalar matrix. So it commutes with any matrix. Also the Grassmann algebra on a countable dimensional vector space over F is PI and it satisfies a, commu a commutator of length three. Okay, the set of uh, polynomial identity satisfied by an algebra is a T ideal of the free algebra. I mean, uh, it is an ideal invariant under all endomorphisms of the free algebra. Moreover, Every T ideal of the free algebra is of this type. I mean, it is the T ideal of all polynomial identities satisfied by a suitable algebra. So sometimes it is convenient to translate a given problem on T ideals of the free algebra in the language of a polynomial identity satisfied by an algebra. In 1950, Spectre- Sorry, Daniela, well, sorry. Uh, we are seeing, or at least I'm seeing your, your slides uh, mm -hmm. later. So it's just, I am one slide before you. It's a little strange. Ah, yes, yes. But yeah. now, okay, now you can has... see a spec problem because I can, I can see what... Uh... No, I'm seeing the T ideal yet. Not the spec problem. Ah, okay, you don't see. Okay, yeah. I don't know the reason because I'm reading. It's very strange. I've okay. never seen this before, sorry. Can you just go one slide more? Okay, let me see if you... Now? No. Now, you don't see anything? Spec problem. Now I see the space problem. Okay, perfect. You, okay, now I understand. You see, um, okay, the point before, okay. Okay, I, thank you, I pay thank attention. You. I, I hope not to forget it. <laughs> okay, uh, so in 1950, Specht uh, raised a problem which was one of the main driving forces in the theory for more than 35 years. Is every proper T ideal of the free associative algebra finitely generated as a T ideal? And um, this problem was solved positively, but I don't know if you can see now, Kemmer, sorry. Maybe I have a problem. Um, because this yes, problem- Yes, I can see. Oh, okay, yes. 
Perfect. This problem was solved by Kemmer in 1987. Okay, now uh, it's okay. So we can say in the language of polynomial identity satisfied by an algebra that any associative algebra has a finite basis of polynomial identities. So it would be interesting to try to find a set of generators of a given T ideal of polynomial identity satisfied by an algebra. But it's not so easy. In fact, there are not so many examples of such ideals. Um, so it's not easy to determine in general a set of generators. Uh, in the examples that we have seen before, a set of generators is known. Okay, for uh, F, uh, the T ideal is generated by a commutator of length two. For UT2, the T ideal is generated by the product of two commutators. For the Grassmann algebra, the T ideal is generated by um, a commutator of length three. And for M2F, the T ideal is generated by the Wagner whole identity and by the standard polynomial of degree four, uh, which is defined in this way. Okay, now um, the standard polynomial of degree 2k is a polynomial identity for the kk by k matrices. And um, it's the statement of uh, the well known theorem of Amitsur Levitsky. I want to remark that for M3, a set of generators is not yet known. For this reason, uh, in order to study a T-ideal, one can determine some numerical invariance that allow to give a description of it. And uh, a very useful numerical invariant that can be attached to a T-ideal uh, is given by the sequence of codimensions that I define in a few seconds. But before, let me start, let me recall that if the characteristic of the field is zero, I do A is completely determined by its multilinear polynomials for the well-known multilinearization process. So, uh, if Pn uh, denotes the vector space of multilinear polynomials in the first uh, n variables, we have that height of A is generated by its subspaces Pn intersection I do A for every n. Okay, now consider this uh, quotient Pn over Pn intersection I do A, and the dimension of this space is called the nth codimension of A. So it's obvious that the, the codimensions gives a lot of uh, um, information about the polynomial identity satisfied by an algebra. Let me uh, show some examples for f, the codimensions are equal to one. For ut2, uh, they were computed by Latishoff and they are exactly two to the n minus one times n minus two plus two. For g, the codimensions are equal to to the n minus one. It, it is a result of a krakowski regf and the codimensions of uh, nk uh, were computed by Regaf and they grow asymptotically like this function. And um, this constant, it was completely uh, com uh, explicitly computed. Okay, now the, the codimensions are bounded from above by n factorial, which is the dimension of uh, Pn of the vector space of multilinear polynomials. But um, in case A is a Pi algebra, Regf proved in 1972 that uh, such a sequence is exponentially bounded. Here, this uh, constant is uh, related to the degree of some polynomial identity satisfied by the algebra. Later, Kemmer in 1978 proved, always for PI algebras, that the sequence of codimensions is polynomially bounded if and only if the variety generated by A does not contain two algebras, G, the Grassmann algebra, and UT2. 
As a consequence of uh, this result, we have that the sequence of codimensions is either polynomially bounded or grows exponentially. Moreover, no intermediate growth between polynomial and exponential is allowed. Finally, uh, the varieties generated by G and UT2 are the only varieties of almost polynomial growth. I mean that they grow exponentially, but any proper subvariety is polynomially bounded. Here, the growth of a variety is the growth of the sequence of codimensions of a generating algebra of the variety. Okay, now uh, the exponential rate of growth of the sequence of codimensions was computed by Gian Bruno and Zaisef uh, in 1999. So they proved that there exist constants such that uh, the codimensions satisfy these inequalities. Hence, the limit of the nth root of codimensions exists and is a non-negative integer called the exponent of A. So with this result, they proved a famous conjecture of Amitsur of the 18th. Let me show some examples. Uh, uh, the exponent of f is uh, uh, equal to 1. The exponent of ut2 and the Grassmann algebra is equal to 2. And the exponent of mk is equal to its dimension. In case of uh, uh, codimensions polynomially bounded, uh, Dreski proved that uh, in this case the codimensions are a polynomial fun function uh, which grows syntactically like Q and to the K where Q is a rational. Moreover, if uh, A is a unitary algebra, we have that uh, this constant satisfies these inequalities. In the non-unitary case, there is no restriction on the value of Q. In fact, it's, um, it's possible to construct for any Q an algebra satisfying this value. Later, with uh, John Bruno and Petrograsky, we refine this result by proving that if K is odd, the lower bound is given by K minus one over K factorial. Moreover, we prove that, that uh, for any k, the upper and the lower bound are reached by constructing algebras realizing such values. They are su subalgebras of the Grassmann algebra or su uh, subalgebras of upper triangular matrices. Now, let me conclude with minimal varieties. Uh, a variety V is a uh, uh, minimal of polynomial growth n to the k if uh, the codimensions grow asymptotically like q times n to the k for some k less or equal, uh, greater or equal than one and uh, q different from zero. But any proper subvariety has codimensions which grow asymptotically like a constant times n to the t, where t is strictly less than k. In uh, 2008, I classify all minimal subvarieties of the varieties of almost polynomial growth. And uh, there is uh, only a finite number of minimal varieties of a given growth. And uh, the, the relevance of uh, this classification of the minimal varieties is realized in the fact that the minimal varieties are the building blocks which allow me to classify all the subvarieties of the varieties generated by G and UT2. In fact, I proved that uh, uh, a subvariety is generated by a finite dimensional algebra, which is a direct sum of algebras which are either nilpotent or commutative or generating minimal varieties of some growth. 
So inspired by these positive results, in order to study varieties of polynomial growth in general, we started with John Brunner's size of the study of minimal varieties of a given growth. And for algebras with one, we proved that the number of minimal varieties of polynomial growth and to the K is finite if and only if K is less or equal than four. Moreover, we classified all minimal varieties of polynomial growth and to the K for K less or equal than phi. And we also gave a receipt to classify all minimal varieties of any polynomial growth. I want to remark that uh, the results we have seen in uh, this talk uh, were generalized by me by, and by other authors, also in uh, the setting of algebras graded by a finite group or algebras with involution or with a trace function and uh, so on. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Daniela. Oh. Now it's time for questions. So does anyone have some questions? You can either write it in the chat or just speak. Okay, could you add me? Because I don't know if uh, I can see the chat, if there is some question. Okay, I can give it to you or read okay. it to you. In okay, case there thank is you. Thank you. Because they have always the same problem with... Uh, oh, I, I'm having problems also. Ah, okay, okay. Now I can see. Okay, but... So, some questions there? Okay. If not, then let's thank Daniela. Thank you very much, okay. Daniela. Thank you, thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, so, but I, I don't know how to... Uh, in, in, the upper, <laughs> in the upper part, you have some bar, some little bar, and then you can stop there. Yes, okay. I I hope to find... Okay. No, no, it's not. Okay, maybe. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yes. I'm a disaster with the technology. <laughs> and different problems have different... <laughs> uh, the buttons in different places and it's very difficult to remember all of them. Mm -hmm. So, Xavi, are you there? Yes, I am, I am. Uh, so, if you want, you can start sharing your screen. I was having problems with, with the slides of Daniela. I don't know if, if you could see them okay. Yeah, I could see them perfectly. That was okay. weird so, of you, I think. <laughs> okay, it's only me. That's right. Okay. <laughs> well, we have one minute. Uh, going to wait a little. <laughs> Yeah, our next talk is in an assertive value so, so you're ready, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes so, so our next speaker is, is Xavi Garcia Martinez uh, from the University of Oviedo and also from the BG University of Brussels. No, I don't know how to speak it, how to spell it. <laughs> um, he, he won the, the prestigious uh, Vincent Cassel Prize here in Spain. Uh, he's a, a brilliant young postdoc. And so, when you want. <laughs> well, th thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> it's University of Vigo, not Oviedo, but... Uh, oh, I sorry, it's Oviedo, Vigo, yeah. I will, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so, well, thank you very much, uh, Jose, for, for organizing this and, and for thinking of, of me about uh, people working in identities in algebras. So, uh, or at least for including the non-associative uh, crazy guys. 
so um, well, I want to uh, to give you a, a little uh, idea of of the work we have been doing lately. Uh, it's called algebras with representable representations, and um, so I want to just to give an answer of four small questions like uh, where do we work? I mean the setting that uh, that we are we are using. Uh, what are we looking for? So, which problem are, are we interested in? How do we work a little bit over there? And uh, what did we find out in the end? So, let me start uh, about talking where. So, we work in varieties of non associative algebras. So, for us, a variety of non associative algebras is just a class of vector spaces with a binary operation that defines some identities. So, we take uh, a class of vector spaces with one multiplication binary, and then you impose some identities, polynomial identities that can be non-associative, non-commutative, can be whatever. So the main example of variety of non-associative algebras is Lie algebras. Uh, you all of you know it. It satisfies these two identities, xx equals zero, and then the Jacobi identity. A very interesting class of non-associative algebras is the variety of associative algebras. So, yeah, they are uh, non-associative algebra that satisfies this identity over here. Then uh, uh, there is the variety of abelian algebras that <clears throat> we call it abelian algebras, uh, even though the abelian in group theory means a different thing. But for us, it means that x, y is equal to zero. This means that uh, in the end, the class is just uh, isomorphic to the to the to the category of, of vector spaces right you have a binary multiplication but this binary multiplication is trivial so in the end you get nothing right but it is a another another variety of non associative algebras um, we work over vector spaces so uh, if the field has some good properties then these varieties can be considered in a in a better setting somehow so if the field is infinite, then all identities can be written uh, in, in the set of generators of uh, homogeneous identities. This means that um, we can talk about degrees of identities. So if an identity has monomials of degree two, three, four, then you can split it. And the identity formed by all monomials of degree two will be an identity, degree three, an identity, and, and so on. Moreover, if the field K has zero characteristic, then all identities can even be considered multilinear. That means that each X, uh, each variable can, uh, only appears once. So, I mean, for example, the identity XX equals zero can be written as X, Y plus Y, X, right? With one X and one Y. So anyway, well, we will work in the, where the field is infinite so we can consider degrees of, of, of identities. Okay, so what are we looking for? So let me begin with uh, the definition of representation of a Lie algebra. I think that you all know it. You can think in groups, it's uh, everything very, very similar than Lie algebras. So a representation of a Lie algebra L on a vector space M is just a map that satisfies this identity, right? This, uh, this is very, very classical. Mm. I like to think of it as two maps this second map is just uh, twisted, and then it's completely defined by the first map, but it will make sense to think about it like this, right? So this, of course, this and this is, are completely uh, equivalent definitions, right? But if we see it like this, we see that in the end, uh, asking for, for these two identities, in the end is just, is just to say that uh, a representation is, just a map, a multiplication of L on M that satisfies the Jacobi identity and the uh, anti-symmetry anti identity, anti-commutativity, right? Another way of thinking about a representation is uh, a Lie algebra structure on the direct sum as vector spaces where L is a subalgebra, M is an abelian ideal. Another way of thinking about representations is just seeing a split extension where M is the kernel, L is the end point, and this, this is a split, so, well, uh, composed, uh, it is the identity. And maybe one way that you are also used to see representations is just as a, as a Lie homomorphism from L to 
GL of M, right? Okay, so let me recap. A representation of Ali algebra is a map satisfying some properties, some the identities of the variety in the end. A, a Lie structure over here, and a split extension over here, or a Lie homomorphism from L to GL of M, right? Okay, now if we want to generalize the definition of representation from Lie algebras to any variety of non-associative algebras, we see that these three properties, the first, second, and third, are very similar and in the end are completely equivalent in any variety of non-associative algebras, where these some properties means the identities of, of your variety. And well, these two, it doesn't deal with identity, so it's okay. But the fourth one is a, a little bit odd, like, uh, this existence of this object seems a, a little bit, I mean, lucky somehow in, in, the, in the setting of Lie algebras. But let me talk about what happens in associative algebras, for example. An associative algebra is a vector space satisfying this identity, right? So a representation of an associative algebra are two maps that satisfy these three identities in the end, because uh, we, since we are acting on M, we have to consider all three possibilities where M is uh, in the first, second, or third position. And, well, it has to satisfy the, well, this X, of course, it's a, it's a typo. Uh, it has to satisfy the, 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 identity, the, the identity of associative algebras. It can be, again, as a associative algebra structure over here. It can be seen as a uh, class of split extension. So the question is, this four, um, this four property that we had in Lie algebras, this existence of this nice object here. So is there a nice object like this in associative algebras? That's a question, right? So can we see um, representations in associative algebras are just associative uh, homomorphisms from L to some nice object over M. So this this was I mean was interesting for us, uh, like because this the existence of this object seems somehow odd, and we we were we were thinking if if it was possible, right? So to do this, we uh, went to the language of category theory. So I promise is the only slide about category theory here, but they have a there is a very good language to express this in, in categorical language, categorical, yeah, categorical terms. So we say that the functor is representable if it's if it is naturally isomorphic to some home. So if it is the same that consider morphism somewhere, right? For example, the uh, functor representations, if we fix L and we send a vector space to the set of representations, representations is isomorphic to this L of home of L to this GL of something, right? So these two functors are representable. This means that representations in Lie algebras are representable, okay? Because the functor representations is representable. So the question in these terms, in this language, is the functor representations of L representable for any other variety of non-associative algebras? So this was our question. Okay. Okay. So this is what we were looking for. How do we work here? Because it seems a bit odd to find this uh, object in a general setting. So first we need some intuition. The category theory gives us some very nice property and properties. And one of them is because of some preservation of products and coproducts that I will not talk about right now, says that representations of two objects in one vector space should be somehow nice to each other, okay? So in the case of associative algebras, imagine that you have some X living in one X, one Y living in different Y. So if we want this, um, this nice object to exist, then the two representations somehow should work nice to each other. So they should satisfy this identity over here because it's completely natural to ask it. The problem is that X is a representation on M completely independent of the representation of Y. Then when X act, acts on M, we live in M, so then Y can act over here. So if we have 
actions of X and actions of Y completely independent to each other, how on earth are we expecting this identity to be true? It doesn't make any sense because they live in two completely different worlds and there is no uh, no, no, no point of, of this being true. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. Uh, on the other hand, imagine that we are in the class of non-associative algebras, so just no identities at all. Imagine that we have X and Y, where should we send this element over here? It doesn't make sense to, since we don't have any identity, there is no nice place to, to send this. Okay, so it seems that both associative algebras are, don't satisfy this identity, it's, it's, uh, its representations are not representable, and it seems that in non-associative algebras, it is uh, the same. It shouldn't have representable representations. Okay. On the other hand, Lie algebras are quite like quite amazing. Uh, so, in Lie algebras, we know where to send this this element over here. Of course, we apply the Jacobi identity, and we send it here. On the other hand, there is no bad relation like we had in 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 associative algebras because of the way that they interact, because of the way that Jacobi identity acts over there and the anti-symmetry, everything has to be completely, perfectly determined. So we ask ourselves this question. Lie algebra seems so special over here. So our first question was, is there, I mean, um, can we classify or find all varieties that satisfy this property? But then after observing it uh, more detailed with the categorical language, the, the real question was, is there another structure where this happens? This was our, our, our real question because Lie algebra seems so special, it seemed so getting to the point. Okay, so, well, I, I won't bore you with the details, but if our variety doesn't have any identity of degree two or three, then this element is not clear where we are going to send it. So. Uh, we, we, we need to have some identity of degree three. I mean, this of course is proving in a mathematical uh, formal way, right? I mean, it's, I'm just expressing the intuition, but in the end we find that we, we need some constants uh, from lambda one to mu eight, so 16 constants to, to have these two identities. Over here, we, we, we need to impose these two identities. Mm. Moreover, uh, if we have uh, identities of degree two, it's quite easy to prove that Lie algebra is the only possibility. But what I want to tell you is the way that we prove that uh, if we don't have any identity of degree two and we have these identities of degree three, how did we prove that there is no possible um, solution? And what we did was we found three nice, uh, representations of free free objects on a 79 dimensional space that I, I don't know where how how did we find this but it works i promise you and uh, we found uh, we found some relations on this on this uh, constant that we had here so we found 224 horrible relations on these coefficients over here so we tried to solve this we tried to solve the the, the, this polynomial system, if we solve it, then we found a, a new variety that will probably satisfy this property. But of course, we didn't compute this by hand. Uh, we, we did it by the help of a computer scientist. scientist. And uh, what did we find out? So what we did in the end, after trying some very crazy things that of course didn't work because, uh, uh, I mean, if you do it like brute force or something, you get nothing with these horrible things. We found a Grobner basis of the ideal generated by these polynomials. So, and uh, this Grobner basis was only this. So this means that uh, there was no solution for, for this Grobner basis. So there was no solution for, for this. Okay. Anyway, just to summarize, well, in characteristic different than two, we, we did some things with some horrible numbers as well, but I don't want to talk about this now. So what I want to say is to state the, the, the final result. And it is that, if V is a non-abelian variety of non-associative algebras over K, then if V has representable representations, if it has these 
very nice property, then it is the variety of Lie algebras. So in the end, it is a, a categorical characterization of, of Lie algebras. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Xavi. So are there any questions? You know, you can write in the chat or just talk. Uh, I do have one question, Xavi. Yes, tell me. In, in, <laughs> in the case you have also identities of the grid two, don't you get any twisting of Lie algebras? Any, something, something similar to Lie algebra but different from Lie algebra? Mm, we, we get it if the characteristic is two. We get the two the two things, right? The um, xx equals zero and xy plus yx equals zero. Yeah. But if the characteristic is different than two, no, because uh, identities of degree two, you only can have commutativity and anti-commutativity in the end. Yeah. Because uh, if you have something weird, like xy plus some lambda yx, then if you apply this identity sometimes, uh, several times, you will get that uh, this coefficient has to be one or minus one. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what I was thinking is, actually, they aren't uh, varieties of non-assertive algebras. I was thinking about cocycles, you know, twisting by a cocycle. You will have a, instead of, of vector spaces, you will have super vector spaces, for example. Uh, uh, su super Lie algebras, Lie super algebras, something like that. Yeah, th then you should work in a, Instead of vector spaces, yes, you say. Yeah. Perhaps, uh, there are, perhaps there are some some other solutions there. But for example, if you impose uh, this uh, super identity, <laughs> then you don't have. Um, it's not a variety of yeah, yeah, yeah. algebras because yeah. this minus one up to the this thing is is not valid. But you can work over different. Uh, instead of vector spaces, you can work over super vector spaces. And uh, it's probably an interesting question to to um, to, to characterize uh, super Lie algebras over there. I mean, maybe you only get super Lie algebras, or maybe you get something else. That that would be a, a, an interesting thing to to think about for sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, are there any other questions? Is there any hope of finding even more larger examples? Uh, so, I think that uh, if we, instead of working in vector spaces, we work in a, a different setting. Uh, yes, for sure. And on the other hand, if, well, I have this, uh, this slide over here, which says that if we work in finite fields, for example, in F2, then the variety of Boolean algebras uh, has representable representations because there is no representations. So there are no representations because of this uh, nasty identity. <laughs> there are no representations, so of course they are all representable. So there are more examples, yes. <laughs> Any more questions? If not, let's thank Xavi again. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Xavi. Thank you. Uh, now it's time for Carla Rizzo to share the her screen. Yes. <laughs> okay. So. So now we turn to, to associative algebras again. And the speaker is, is Carla Rizzo, also from the University of Palermo, also a former student of Antonio and Bruno, and soon to be a postdoc at Coimbra. So are you ready, Carla? Thank you very much. Thank you to invite me. And uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, so today I'm going to present some new results on differential identities and the varieties of algebras. 
In fact, alongside the ordinary identities uh, introduced by La Mattina in the first talk, uh, it's often convenient to, to study the polynomial identities of algebra with an, an additional structure, such as algebra uh, with the derivation. Uh, in fact, uh, in general, such identities theoretically determine the ordinary ones, and also they allow us to construct finer invariant that can be related to the ordinary one. So in this context, it, it is interesting to uh, try to extend the combinatorial method of the polynomial identities for associative algebra to algebra with additional structure. So let's start by recalling what is a derivation for, a, for an algebra. So for me, F will be, uh, in what follows, F will be a field of characteristic zero, and A will be an associative F algebra. I, re I refer to it uh, as F algebra or, uh, or simply algebra, uh, but I mean always associative algebra. So uh, a derivation of, why? Okay. A derivation of A is a linear map D from A to A such that it acts to, uh, to a product of two uh, elements of the algebra A in this way. So, uh, this, uh, of course, the set of all derivation of A is a Lie algebra. Uh, an example of derivation for any associative algebra is the so-called inner derivation induced by an element of the algebra. In fact, a inner derivation induced by an element A of the uh, associative algebra A uh, is, uh, the, is the linear map uh, that uh, I call add A, uh, add of A, uh, that sent uh, any element B into the commutators uh, of A and B. So, uh, for example, if we consider the algebra of T2 of two times two upper ma uh, triangular matrices, that is uh, an algebra that play a key role in the PI theory, as told uh, la mattina, um, in, in for this algebra, uh, Coelho e Polsino proved that any derivation is inner. So for this algebra, uh, we have only inner derivation. In uh, and also, if we uh, define epsilon to be the, deriv the inner derivation induced by the matrix unit E11 and the delta, the, the inner derivation induced by the matrix unit E21, then it's not hard to prove that the Lie algebra of all derivation UT2 is a two-dimensional metabelian Lie algebra with basis these two derivation. Uh, so mm, this is an, an example of derivation for algebras. Uh, so uh, now uh, let L be a Lie algebra over F. Uh, from, now until, uh, from now until the end of the talk, for, for me, L will be always a Lie algebra. And uh, let A, a be uh, an F algebra such that L acts on it by derivation. Uh, that means that there is a morphism from L to A. Then we can uh, think that L acts on A as a Lie subalgebra of the Lie algebra of all derivation of A. Uh, so uh, since any uh, Lie algebra possess a unique un universal enveloping algebra, then we can extend this L action on A uh, into, a, into an UL action on, on A. In fact, by the theorem of poincare birkhoff witt uh, if we fix a base a uh, basis of uh, the Lie algebra L, uh, an ordered basis of the, of the Lie algebra L, then UL has a basis of, uh, of this form, uh, where um, uh, the element of the basis are uh, words in the alphabet in the basis, uh, the basis uh, L of, of L, uh, where the, in the index are all ordered. So, uh, by this theorem, we can uh, naturally extend the L action on A to, into a UL action in this way. So uh, a product uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, derivation acts on A in this way. They act sequentially. Uh, so in this way, A becomes a, UL mod a left UL module, and we call it algebra with derivation or simply L algebra. 
So um, it, it's clear that any associative F-algebra can be regarded as an L-algebra, where L acts trivial unit. Uh, this is because uh, the universal enveloping algebra is an associative algebra with unit. So, for example, uh, the algebra of two times two upper triangular matrices, the associative algebra, the classical algebra UT2, is uh, an L-algebra, uh, where L acts trivially on it. Another example of L algebra is uh, the algebra of two times two upper triangular matrices, where this time L acts as the one dimensional uh, Lie algebra spanned by uh, the derivation epsilon, and we call it UT2 epsilon. Uh, also, another example of L algebra is the algebra of two times two upper triangular matrices, where this time L acts as the one dimensional uh, Lie algebra spanned by the derivation delta. And in in this case, we call it UT2 delta. These three algebra are, uh, are, um, are, L, uh, are distinct L algebras, are all distinct. So now, as in the ordinary case, we won't define the polynomial identities for such algebras that take into account the uh, structure of L algebras. So in order to do this, we need to introduce a free object that, take, that, that, that takes into account uh, the uh, structure of L algebra. So we consider a vector space uh, with a non-commutative uh, non countable basis X. And so the tensor, uh, the tensor algebra of this tensor product, the tensor product of UL and B, uh, is a free associative algebra with, free, with uh, these free generators, where we use the exponential notation for simplicity, uh, where HI is an, uh, are elements of the basis of UL, and XJ are uh, element of the basis uh, of B. Uh, so uh, this uh, free algebra um, is the essentially the algebra of non-commutative polynomial in these variables. Uh, and so a basis of uh, this algebra uh, consists in all words of this type uh, and that we call monomials. And the product of any two monomials is given by just a position. Uh, this algebra, this free algebra, has a, a structure of L algebra by defining the L action on it in this way is a formal action clearly. Uh, and then by extending it into an action of uh, the universal enveloping algebra. So since uh, the uh, universal enveloping algebra uh, is an algebra with unit, then we can embed the set X into uh, this, uh, this algebra and uh, by uh, identify an element of the type Xi to the one uh, with the element of the set. And so in this, in, we can uh, regard this uh, free algebra as a free associative algebra on the set X and its uh, element uh, are called differential polynomials. So a differential identities for uh, an L algebra A uh, is a, a um, differential polynomial that vanishes under all evaluation of A. An example of differential uh, identities is this polynomial that is a differential uh, identity for the uh, matrix, uh, for the two times two matrices uh, regarded uh, as L algebra, where L uh, acts as the Lie algebra of all derivation. So in order to study, as in the ordinary ca case, in order to study the polynomial identity, it's interesting to uh, consider the set of all, of all differential identities of a given L algebra. This set, as in the case of ordinary identities, uh, is a TL ideal uh, of the free L algebra. That means is a, a two-side ideal that is invariant under all the LN under all the endomorphism of the free algebra and also is invariant under all endomorphism of uh, the universal enveloping algebra. Uh, also, any TIL ideal is of this form, then study uh, differential identities satisfied by, by a given L algebra means study the TIL ideal of the free L algebra. Example of uh, 
generators of uh, TL ideals are, uh, for example, for the algebra UT2, uh, where L, X, uh, L acts trivially on it. In this case, uh, since L acts trivially on it, uh, the uh, TL ideal is uh, exactly the same of the, uh, of, the T, of the ordinary ones. Because in this case, uh, uh, Essentially, we have, uh, if, if we act trivially on, on the algebra, we have simply an associative algebra. Another example of generators of TL ideal, for example, uh, for the algebra UT2 epsilon, uh, and also uh, in, I found the, the generators of the algebra UT2 delta. Uh, uh, so since it's very hard and difficult to try to find uh, the, the generators of any TL ideals, then it's convenient to introduce some invariant that measure in some way the growth of the differential identities of, uh, of uh, an, an L algebra. So in order to do this, we consider the space of multilinear differential polynomial, this space, this one, and since in characteristic zero, uh, that TL Idea, the TL ideal are completed determined by their multilinear polynomial, then as in the ordinary case, we consider uh, the co-dimension of the space of, of multilinear differential identities of A into the space of multilinear uh, differential polynomial. Uh, this non-negative integer is an invariant for, uh, is an invariant, and we call it an differential co-dimension. The, uh, the the, the numerical sequence associated uh, to it uh, is, a, is called the differential codimension sequence and give us uh, a measure of the growth of the differential identities of the algebra. Uh, example of computing uh, of um, um, of codimension, differential codimension sequence are these three. Uh, notice that these two algebras, is, even if I uh, have different, uh, different uh, uh, generators for the T L ideal, uh, I have uh, the same uh, codimension, the differential codimension sequence. Uh, so, since it's a very technical and uh, difficult uh, task, uh, try to uh, estimate this value, uh, then it seems interesting to try to estimate it asymptotically. Uh, in fact, in this setting, Corbianco in 2013 proved the uh, so called Amit. Um, Amit's or conjecture for, uh, al for L algebra. In fact, he proved that uh, the, the differential codimension of any finite dimensional L algebra is squeezed between these two functions, where uh, C1, T1, C2, T2 are uh, constant, and D is a non negative integer. As a consequence of, the res of this result, he proved that there exists the limit of the hand root of the hand differential codimension of uh, any any finite dimensional L algebra and uh, is a non negative integer, and we call it the L exponent of A. This, uh, the existence of the L exponent uh, clearly gives us an integer scale uh, that allows us to classify the TL ideals in terms of the, uh, their, their uh, exponent, exponential rate of growth. Also, another consequence of this result that, uh, is that for the differential codimension, uh, uh, the differential codimension is either polynomially bounded or grows exponentially. So in this setting, since uh, different L algebra can have uh, the same TL ideal, uh, it's interesting to introduce the so-called L variety uh, generated by an L algebra. An L variety generated by an L algebra is the class of all algebra uh, that satisfy, uh, of all L algebra that satisfy the same differential identities of the given algebra. So since uh, the variety are completely determined by the uh, TL ideal, of A, then we call this TL ideal the TL ideal of the variety. And then uh, we can uh, so uh, um, define the differential codimension of the variety to be uh, the differential codimension of um, the, uh, the generating algebra. And, um, and so we can, we can talk about the growth of a, a variety and the growth of a variety is the growth of uh, the, its uh, differential uh, 
codimension sequence. Also, we can define the, the exponent of a variety to be the exponent of uh, the hell exponent of uh, the generating uh, its generating algebra. Uh, so a variety, since uh, by the result of Gordienko, we know that the codimension sequence is, uh, the differential codimension sequence is uh, a polynomially bounded or grows exponentially, uh, we can uh, say that a variety has polynomial growth if its codimension sequence is polynomially bounded. Uh, the variety has almost polynomial growth if its codimension sequence is not polynomially bounded, so it grows exponentially, uh, it, it says it's L exponent, it's two, but every proper subvariety has polynomial, uh, has polynomial growth. Uh, so in this setting, it's interesting to try to study variety of almost polynomial growth in order to classify the variety of polynomial growth. Uh, example variety of, uh, of L variety of almost polynomial growth are, uh, for example, the variety uh, UT2, where L, uh, the variety generated by UT2 where L, where L hacks trivially on it. Uh, also, Jambrun uh, and I proved in 2019 that the, var the hell variety generated by UT2 epsilon has, has also almost polynomial growth. Uh, this, um, this variety has almost polynomial growth. But for example, the variety uh, generated by UT2 delta uh, has no almost polynomial growth. In fact, even if it, UT2 delta acts as exponent 2, uh, uh, this variety has no almost polynomial growth. In fact, it has a sub-variety, this one, the variety generated by UT2. Uh, in a paper of this year, in a preprint, Edo Santos, Viera and I uh, classify uh, the uh, variety of polynomial growth. In fact, we proved that the differential codimension sequence of any finite dimensional L algebra is polynomially bounded if and only if UT2 and UT2 epsilon don't belong uh, to the L variety generated by uh, the algebra A. And so, as a consequence, we proved that the only two L varieties generated by finite dimensional L algebra of almost polynomial growth are the varieties generated by UT2 and UT2 epsilon. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kanda. <laughs> Do you have any questions? You can just speak or write your question in the chat as you prefer. So. Someone is thanking you in the chat. Thanking all of us. I, I do have a question. Okay. <laughs> in Gordiesco theorem, why do we need uh, the hypothesis of finite dimensional algebras? Finite in, dimension. the, in the Gordienko result. Uh, why in this context do we need finite dimension? Uh, because in this context, um, in general, um, the, when we use, uh, when we study, the problem in this case is that uh, the universal enveloping algebra, because we study the, the, the L algebra, are algebra where UL acts on it. And UL uh, is, uh, in general, an infinite dimensional L, uh, in, uh, is an infinite dimensional uh, associative algebra. And so uh, the problem is that we can uh, manage the, the this action if uh, the the algebra is inf is infinite because yeah. if a is finite dimensional uh, the action of the Lie algebra is also finite. And so when we pass to universal evolving algebra, the action is in some sets in some sets finite dimensional. Mm -hmm. Because we can, uh, at uh, not all the elements of the universal enveloping algebra act uh, not trivially to it. It's only a final number. And then we can uh, study the multilinear polynomial and the alternating polynomial, so on. So this is the problem. And also the problem uh, that we, uh, and also the problem is that uh, in general for the universal enveloping algebra is not uh, enough, uh, um, is not, uh, it, in general we know the result for, um, 
final when um, the op algebra that acts is final dimensional okay. and so since ul is not final dimensional we can solve it in this way okay yeah so this is the problem the action okay okay thank okay. you very much i don't know if i'm clear but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah yeah so there's no more time for for questions so thank you very much carla thank you to <laughs> everybody nice. Beselin, uh, your micro and your camera are off. Can you turn them on, please? Perhaps he's having some problems. Yeah. Um, can you listen to me now? Now, now I can hear you, but I don't see you. Okay, I have to, to find, um, okay, start video or, now it's yeah. okay? Yeah, now I can see. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and please on me also. Sorry? Do you listen to me? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. So, <laughs> well, I don't think, I think that. No, Mr. 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 Знаю, но сейчас начинаю. А почему ты не сделал пять минут перед этим? Потому что Бигги Декларис там. А вот. How much time do I have? I should start immediately or? No, I don't, we don't have a problem. You don't have to rush. You will have your, your 40 minutes. Uh, don't worry. So. Okay. Um, give me five minutes then. Ah, do you need five minutes now? Yeah, okay, yes. Okay. So, sorry about this, we are going to, to start in five minutes, more or less. If you need to go to the bathroom or to drink some water or something, that's the moment. So, I will leave for a second also. Okay. okay, sorry, I'm ready already. I simply had to switch on the other computer, <laughs> which has to speak German. <laughs> Should I start, Jose? So we are here again? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, I think that Vesli Indreski doesn't really need an introduction. He's a very well known <laughs> expert. Uh, I'm a mathematician in, in the field of polynomial identities in algebras, and he has worked in, in everything, in central polynomials, in polynomial identities of matrix algebras, in invariant theory, and in everything. So it's a great pleasure for me to have him here today, speaking about non-commutative invariant theory. Okay, thank you very much for the possibility to give this talk. With the Google Translator, I should say, Muito obrigado pelo convite para dar essa conferência. <laughs> I'm not sure that my Portuguese is very well, but I think that it's okay. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
So I started with this that everyone knows at least one theorem in invariant theory. This is the theorem that every symmetric polynomial can be expressed in a unique way as a polynomial in elementary symmetric polynomials. Of course, if you want to formalize this, you have a finite set of variables. You consider the polynomial algebra and define the action of the symmetric group. Um, in this way, you simply uh, change um, the place of the variables. And of course, the symmetric polynomials, they are the fixed points of this action. So um, the polynomials, which are the same, um, um, when you act with all uh, elements of the symmetric group. And of course, the theorem is that the symmetric polynomials are generated by the elementary symmet symmetric polynomials, and this presentation is unique. So in, in, in the language of algebra, this means that they're uh, algebraically independent. And if you change a little bit the problem, you can see that not all symmetric polynomials, but only cyclically symmetric, which are the same if you change um, 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 cyclically the variables, then um, you have again this elementary symmetric polynomials, but you have one more polynomials which you need to present everything um, um, as a polynomial of this thing. So the elementary symmetric, symmetric polynomials are not enough. You need also this polynomial of degree three, which is um, not symmetric in the usual way. So uh, what is the difference? The difference is that if you, if you add one more um, um, uh, symmetric polynomial, then it turns out that this extra polynomial which we have satisfies a quadratic relation with coefficients which are symmetric polynomials. And of course, you can present um, um, the cyclic symmetric polynomials in, in this form as elementary symmetric, symmetric polynomial, a product of elementary symmetric polynomials or elementary symmetric polynomials multiplied by this extra polynomial. So in, in the language of, um, of presentation, this algebra is isomorphic the algebra of the four variables module a quadratic equation. So classical invariant theory studies a generalization of this question. We fix a field of characteristic zero and assume that this field is algebraically closed, although some results they hold in, in a more general setup, but it's really necessary to have a characteristic zero. And you have the general linear group this is the group of the invertible matrices. It acts canonically uh, on, the, on, uh, on the vector space with basis, um, um, the variables. And you take this diagonally. You simply have the same action as the action of the symmetric group, but you act on, on the elements here. And the algebra G variants, these are all polynomials which are fixed under the action of the elements of, of the group. So, um, um, the people who work in invariant theory, um, they have a little bit different point of view. For them, the polynomials are functions. So you have a vector space with basis v1, vd, and the polynomial functions, they are functions which, um, um, for example, um, the, the functions xi, um, to each vector it presents the heat coefficient um, the coordinate of the vector. And of course, then the general linear group acts in, in, in a little bit different way. It acts on, on, on the vectors and you take the value of the vector for the corresponding polynomial. But there is, um, this is almost the same because the general linear group is isomorphic to the opposite with the obvious um, isomorphism. And to each matrix, you send the, the inverse of the transpose. And then if you replace the general linear group with the opposite, um, you have um, um, the things which I started. And this approach is more convenient for, um, for the purposes of uh, generalization. So the origins of invariant theory, they are um, in the work by Lagrange, Gauss, and also they studied representations of integers by quadratic binary forms. And they use the discriminant to distinguish the uh, non-equivalent forms. But it was some origins before the real invariant theory 
The real invariant theory starts um, in 1840s with the works of Boo in England and Hesse in Germany. And then, of course, the, uh, many famous mathematicians were there, Cayley, Sylvester, Glebs, Gordon, Hubert, Emmy, Nodger, and of course, I can continue the list with more people. So, what is the problem? You consider the invariants of the group G and you want to describe this algebra of invariants. Of course, the first question is whether this algebra is finitely generated for all subgroups of the general linear group. And this was the main motivation for the 14th uh, Hubert problem, uh, which was he stated in, in, in his famous lecture at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris in the, um, in the beginning of the previous century. And of course, the answer is yes, when the group is finite. This is a theorem of M. Nodger, which, by the way, the proof is, uh, is very transparent and very nice. It's a, is access, um, accessible for students uh, who have a very, very naive knowledge of algebra. For reductive groups, okay, um, I don't want to, to say the definition of reduction, reductive group, but you can think that there are some nice groups. The answer is again, yes. And of course, it was stated in the work by Hubert, but um, not in this generality, but the proof is the same. And the proof was not constructive. And in the, in the general case, the answer is no. There is a famous counterexample of Nagata um, um, about 70 years ago. And the, and the first approach to find explicit sets of generators for, for different groups G. By the way, in the beginning of invariant theory, there were papers where um, they solved this problem for different groups, and the statements of the theorems took several pages to have simply the generators of the group. So, um, and if you have finite groups, then uh, the theorem of Eminotter states that um, um, the algebra of invariance is generated by uh, polynomials of degree bounded by. Um, by the number of elements of the group G. So um, there is a nice algorithm to solve to find the, the generator explicit, even if you, um, if you try to solve some systems of homogeneous linear equations, you can solve the problem. So this problem for finite groups is easy to solve. And the next question is, if the algebra invariance is finitely generated, then it's a homomorphic image of the polynomial algebra. Um, and uh, you want to find the kernel. Um, um, so you want to find the presentations of the algebra. And the Hubert basis theorem, it states that every ideal of the, of the polynomial algebra is finitely generated. Of course, this is a non-constructive proof. And if the group is finite, you get immediately that the algebra of invariants is finitely presented, finitely presented, is finitely generated with a finite number of defining creations between the generators. And this is a little bit strange, but you know that in that time, um, the, the proofs of Hubert, which were uh, non-constructive, they were accepting uh, very skeptically by the mathematicians in this time. And even Gordon, who, who was known as the king of invariant theory, said once that this is not mathematics, this is theology. Of course, it's not clear whether uh, Gordon really said this because um, the reference was uh, 25 years after this, when um, he passed away already. And it was known that in, it's not clear, even if he said this, whether this is negative or positive or is, is simply a joke. But it's known that Gordon himself in, encouraged Hubert, and he, some used, he himself used several times the Hubert's resistance methods. And, and probably this is simply a myth, but okay, this is some, simply some kind of fun. So the next question is how many are the invariants? Of course, the algebra invariant is a graded vector space. The polynomial algebra is graded. So you have homogeneous elements of zero degree, of first degree, second degree, etc., etc. And the same holds for the algebra of invariants. And then you can define 
the generating function of the dimension of the homogeneous component. And, and this is called the Hubert series or Poincare series. The people in variant theory like Poincare series, um, but the people doing commutative algebras for them Poincare series something else. So I prefer to use the name Hubert series. And there is the Moulin formula, which states that if the group is finite, then the Hubert series of the algebra invariants, this is simply um, um, a sum of um, um, some power series, which are the inverses of some determinants. So you, you take the determinant here, and since this is one minus um, something which depends on Z, you can expand this as a series, and um, this is one. And if the group is infinite, then there is a general principle by Hermann Weyl that you replace the sum with an inter integral. And of course, there is another theorem by Hubert Serre that for reductive groups, the algebra invariant is a rational function. So I shall add one more theorem by Chevalier Shepard Todd, which states that if we have a finite group, then the algebra invariant is a polynomial algebra. So uh, uh, there are no relations between the, the minimal set of generators, if and only if the group is generated by pseudo reflections. Pseudo reflections, they are matrices, um, a finite multiplicative order, such that all eigenvalues are one except one. And in the case of reflections, this extra eigenvalue is minus one, in a general case, is simply root of one. And if, if you go back to our examples, the symmetric group is generated by tra transpositions and transpositions are reflections. And for this, um, the cyclic group of order three, the Jordan form of the matrices of this form, and of course, this is not a pseudo reflection because you have two different um, roots. And now, um, you know that the old Greeks and, and they thought that um, the word um, is flat and is on three waves. In India, they thought that there are four elephants. And now, if you go to the invariant theory of finite groups, I shall try to make a similar picture. You have several theorems, which are um, the Moulin formula, the theorem of M in order that finite groups, they have finite um, um, finitely generated algebras invariant, the Hubert basis that, and the Schaeffer Todd Chevalier theorem, which states that the algebra is polynomial if and only if it's generated by the group is generated by pseudo reflections. Now, um, if you consider non commutative invariant theory, we should replace um, the polynomial algebra with something else. And uh, we should take several properties. We have several interesting properties of polynomial algebra, but we should, um, we should consider the following property. If you have a commutative algebra, then every map from the, um, um, the variables of the polynomial algebra can be extended to a homomorphism. And this means that the polynomial algebra is free in the class of all commutative algebras. So which are the possible candidates? Of course, the free associative algebra. This is the algebra of, non of polynomials in non commuting variables. It's convenient to consider that one is mm, all algebras are unitary. You can consider the same the free, the free Lie algebra, the free non associative algebra, etc. etc. So if you look for, um, for the origins of non commutative invariant theory, I would say that uh, Margaret Wolf in 1935, in her PhD thesis, she had um, um, she studied the symmetric polynomials in non-commuting variables. And I'll mention one theorem for this. There is also a paper published a year later. So the algebra of symmetric polynomials in non-commuting variables, of course, you assume that you have more than one variable, is a free associative algebra. So there are no relations. It has a homogeneous system of free generators such that for each degree, you have one or more um, generators of degree n. 
and the number of the homogeneous uh, polynomials of degree n, this is the same independent here of the system of homogeneous system of free generators of the algebra. So, um, and if you have some symmetric polynomial, you can express this um, with some, um, okay, uh, some analog of the elementary symmetric polynomials in a unique way. And the coefficients, um, they are integers, uh, linear combinations of, of, of the coefficients of the original polynomial. So this is simply, um, you have some analog with the case of symmetric polynomials in commuting variables. Then, if you have a finite group acting on, on, on the free uh, polynomial of, of the free associative algebra, there are many things. The results are due to Harchenko, Lane, Dixon, Forman X. And then, uh, when this algebra is finitely generated, it's finitely generated only the, if the group is psychic and acts by scalar multiplication. So, in, in, in really a trivial case, the Moulin formula is replaced by something similar, but, but instead of products of determinants, you have um, a sum of traces. So you have the trace of the matrices. Of course, the algebra uh, of invariants, it's always free. And even there is a Galois correspondence between the subgroups of G and the free subalgebras, which contain um, the algebra of invariants. So this is simply um, the correspondences to each H you, sub, you put to correspondence the invariants of this H. And if you have a reductive group, then the Hubert series may be not a rational function. For example, even in the simplest case, we have SL2 uh, acting on a two-dimensional vector space, then the Hubert series is some quadratic function. Not quadratic, you have square roots here. And um, nevertheless, you have something positive. There is a theorem of Kurukin that if you have the symmetric group of degree n acting on the polynomials, uh, of, um, homogeneous polynomials of degree n, changing the place of the variables, we can keep the polynomial, the free associative algebra with this action. And when the characteristic is zero and you have a reductive subgroup of the general linear group, then the algebra of the invariants with this additional action is, is finitely generated. So the algebra is not finitely generated, but if you allow to mix the elements, um, the positions of the, of the elements of degree n, then it's already finitely generated. And if you have the free Lie algebra or the absolutely free associative, non associative algebra, then you have something, um, okay, not so nice that if the group is um, uh, non-trivial, then um, the Lie invariants, uh, they are ne never finitely generated algebra. And for the free uh, non-associative algebra, the invariants, they are also not free. Of course, there are uh, some classical results that the subalgebra of the free Lie algebra and the free associative, non-associative algebra, they are always free. So the problem for, for whether they are free or not, it's solved trivially. And what happens with the, the Hubert series? For the Lie algebra, uh, you see the Hubert series is not nice. So um, with the invariant, it's even worse. But if the group is finite, then the Hubert series of the invariant of the free non-associative algebra, they are algebraic. It's easy to see. I will discuss it later. But for reductive groups, the result is um, not very nice. For example, if you consider the same case, you have SL2 acting on the two-dimensional vector space, then you have an elliptic integral. And the proof uses some non-commutative analog of this Moulin value integral formula for the Hubert series in the classical invariant theory. So this is simply some exotics. But uh, what are the other possibilities for non-commutative variant theory? 
So here I should be thankful to Daniela, who introduces everything I need for my talk. So we have a variety of associative algebras. I assume that uh, the algebra are uh, unitary, although some of the results they, they also hold in, in the general case. And I consider the T idea of the algebra, of course, then we consider the relatively free algebra of rank D, so with degenerators. And, and the general linear group uh, again acts canonically on the, on, on the vector space spanned by the axis. And this action is taken diagonally, as in the case of the polynomial algebra and the free associative algebra. And of course, we studied the, the fixed points. So, what we need from the theory of PI algebras, of course, there are several theorems, which some of them Daniel mentioned, some of them I should other. This is the Mitsur Levitsky theorem, the central polynomials for matrices by Formanek and Razmiswov, the Shershov high theorem. By the way, as immediate consequence of the Shershov high theorem, you get that finitely generated PI algebras have finite, uh, finite Gelfand Kirov dimension, which simply means that the growth in, um, um, uh, of the algebra is, poly is polynomial. I'll add here the theorem of Regel for the exponential growth of the codimension. Also, I'll add the structure theory of the ideals of Kemmer. As a consequence of this theory, you have that the Hubert series of the relatively free algebras, they are rational functions, and the theorem of John Bruno and Zaitsev about the exponent that this is uh, exists and is a non negative integer. And I um, I made the same picture, but a little bit more. So here you have these four theorems. Here you have the theorem of Kemmer, the theory of Kemmer here. Here you have the theorem of Beryl as a consequence of the theorem of Chershov. Here this theorem of Belov and Jambruno Zaitsev, they are more or less depend on the structure theory of Kemmer. So these are the things which you need to have some the non commutative variant theory for this context. So here we have three parameters. One parameter, this is the rank of the relatively free algebra. But it turns out that in many important cases, the results are similar in depending on the rank. For example, if the rank is more than one, because in one you have simply something commutative, the results are similar. Then you have the variety V. Again, as in the case discussed by um, Daniela and Carla, we have some limit varieties so that um, the algebra of invariants, they have similar properties if these limit varieties are not sub varieties of, of our variety. And also, um, the third parameter, this is the group G, we should discuss properties which hold for all groups of a given class. For example, for all finite groups or for all reductive groups. And when you have an action of finite groups, and we're interested in the finite degeneration of the algebra of invariants, here there are uh, many people involved. Again, we assume that the algebras are unitary. So if the variety satisfies um, a, a polynomial identity which is different from zero, then you have a lot of conditions which are equivalent. And if one of these conditions is satisfied for some D, then it's satisfied for all this. So one of the conditions is the algebra is finitely generated for every finite subgroup of the general linear group. Then it's enough to show this only for one um, cyclic group, assuming that the generator is a matrix with um, finite multiplicative order with different, with two different eigenvalues. Uh, so you have uh, some condition involving um, weak Newtonian. So you have a ascending chain condition for two-sided ideals. Then you have, um, okay, there are many um, cases cons consisting explicit polynomial identities, even something about um, um, when the field is countable, what happens with uh, with the homomorphic images of, of this algebra, some explicit identities which are uh, hold for this algebra. By the way, this identity in three variables we sh sh shall state it later. Then 
you have some specific polynomial units which should be satisfied by um, the algebra or some algebra which is um, um, uh, uh, the following form you have matrices with polynomial entries but these polynomial entries cannot be too high and here you have uh, uh, something which um, here you have some coefficient t some variable t which pose the thing so these elements cannot be of too high degree so um, all these conditions they are equivalent but they are due to the efforts of many people so there is a simple criteria you start with two by two matrices and you can say this matrix um, the diagonal matrix with minus one plus one and if um, the algebra of invariance uh, um, of the variety in, in the two generated case is finitely generated, then, then it holds for all the elements. So this is maybe the, simple, the simplest way to say this. And now there is a theorem about the degree of the generators. So this is more or less similar to the original case of uh, M in, in, in M in Yotter, um, the algebra of invariance of a finite group uh, um, uh, has a set of generators which are bounded of the degree uh, 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 of the order of the group. But here, um, if you have a variety which satisfies the condition of the previous theorem, so um, the finite system of generators um, uh, is, uh, uh, can be found explicitly because um, uh, the generators um, they have degree which is bounded in terms of the order of the group, the degree of the polynomial, which I mentioned the polynomial in three variables, and the commutator idea of this algebra is nilpotent, and it depends on the class of nilpotency. So here the, the rank is the order of the group. So this is something which uh, can be solved explicitly again to find the generators. So the Hubert series, you have that the Hubert C, the relatively free algebra is multi graded. So, this is something similar to the case of the polynomials when you count each variable and you, you have a, a, a Z degrading this. So, you have the homogeneous components um, with respect to each variable, and you consider the Hubert series. Then there is a theorem of Formanek, which states that if you have the eigenvalues of the matrices of the group, um, the algebra invariance in the case of finite group, this is some um, you replace in the Hubert series here the variables with the eigenvalues multiplied by z, and you get uh, the Hubert series of the algebra invariance. So, in the case of the polynomial algebra, you have that the polynomial algebra, this is the free algebra of the variety of all commutative algebras. The Hubert series is this. And if you replace here the, with the eigenvalues, you get the determinant. So you, you have the Moulin formula. In the case of the free associative algebra, when you have the variety of all associative algebras, the Hubert series is of this form. And if you take this one, you get the trace. So you get the formula of Dixon formula. In the general case, there is a theorem of Belov. I mentioned that um, the Hubert series of the, the relative free algebra is a rational function. It has a precise, a precise version by Berel that this is a rational function, even if you consider as a Hubert series in many variables. And again, you obtain that the algebra, the Hubert series and algebra invariant is a rational function. So if you consider the analog of the theorem of Chevalier for top, Gronik has a negative result about generic matrices. Matej Domokos has this in the general case. That for a finite group, the algebra of the invariance of the relatively free algebra is isomorphic um, to a relatively free algebra if and only the algebra is generated by pseudo reflections and the variety satisfies a commutator of string three. So this means that the variety is either generated by the Grassmann algebra or by finite, the Grassmann algebra of finite dimensional vector space. So so if you consider reductive groups, you have the question of finite generations. You see that for 
if the group is finite, then the condition that the algebra invariant is finitely generated is, is a very strong restriction of the variety. For reductive groups, you add more groups, so you have even stronger condition. And again, you have a lot of conditions by many people here. So this algebra of invariant is finitely generated for all elements D and all reductive groups if the first condition is the algebra is finitely presented. This means that the T ideal of the algebra, um, um, the T ideal of the polynomial identities of the variety V is finitely generated as an ordinary ideal. So this algebra of rank two is finitely presented. You have local unitarian property. So local unitarian means that ascending chain conditions for left ideals when the algebra is finitely generated. So there are explicit identities. So the algebra satisfies the angular identity. Another identity, it doesn't contain the algebra of two by two upper triangle matrices, or satisfies the polynomial identities in, in two variables, which is linear in one of the variables. And there are also some more conditions. For example, um, the simplest one is that you consider the two generated relatively free algebra, and you consider the diagonal in this group when you have um, here. Um, some um, um, non-negative number that here you have the inverse. So if this algebra is fine, you generate that you have the, the general case. Even some more cases concerning transcendence degree of some algebra, et cetera, et cetera. So this is. But um, the rationality of the Hilbert series for all reductive group is this rational function. So even you, you can say this for a larger class of groups with the property that for, uh, if you consider the, the usual invariants, if the Hilbert series is a rational function, more or less always, you have that um, this Hilbert series is also a rational function. So the problem is, if we know explicitly the Hilbert series of the relative free algebra, how to calculate the Hilbert series of the algebra invariants? So if the group is finite, then you can, you can use the theorem of formally because you have the eigenvalues of the elements of the group, you can do this. If this is reductive, you can use a non-commutative analog of the Moulin-Weil integral formula. So you have to solve integrals, which is not a very pleasant thing. In the case of the classical groups, so you have the special linear group, the special orthogonal group, the orthogonal group, the, the symplectic group. Um, um, there is a method of Elliot more than 120, almost 120 years ago, um, um, to solve a homogeneous system of, uh, of the Ophantin equations in non negative integers. And um, it, it was started by Beryl, and, and then we continue this in a big team. So and we replace simply the computations with the Mulu, we set to solve integrals. We have some purely algebraic computations with an easy computerization. So I think that I should thank you very much for, for the possibility to give this talk. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. So now it's time for questions. Do you have any questions? You know, you can talk or just write in the chat. I do have a question. Yeah, okay. It's a related question, actually, because I was thinking about uh, group algebras. Instead of the invariant theory of free algebras or some kind of the invariant theory of group algebras. What can we say or what can be done? Are there similar theorems? Okay, I don't know. You should ask Jim Bruno, maybe. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> but you ask about um, the action of uh, subgroups of the, gen uh, of, of, of the group, which is um, in the group algebra. Or so, how yes, mo more or less. I was thinking about some some Galois extensions, there are some group algebras there, and you have a, an action of the Galois group. So you can see the, uh, yes. um, 
the group algebra of a group G, and you consider the action of, of a subgroup H of G? Not, not really, but close. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's, it was very, very interesting, your talk. Many things to, to think about. So are there any more questions? I don't think so. So let's thank Vesely for his return. Thank, thank, thank you very, you very much. much. And thank you for accepting my invitation. So I think this is all. We are going to close our session now. Uh, unless you have any general comments or questions, I want to th thank all the speakers and all the participants for being here in this nice session.